in Britain began with the biggest parade in British history, which was Queen Victoria's funeral. If everybody loves a parade, nobody ever loved parades more than the Edwardians. Demonstrating that you were part of a club, a society, a religious group was incredibly important. The Whitson parades, the church parades, one of the extraordinary things about the film is you can go to northern town to see almost exactly the same ha thing happening this coming Whitsuntide. It was also an age of great political turmoil. It was an age where the growth of the trade unions came into power. But turmoil was not the filmmaker's subject, and neither was poverty. Mitchell and Kenyon ignored the 30% of the population who were poor. They couldn't buy tickets. Fleeing the shadow of Europe's wars were many of these people that Mitchell and Kenyon filmed at the port of Liverpool, their last stop on their immigration route across Europe and across the United Kingdom towards their futures in America. Half a million people made the grueling trip from England to America in the Edwardian decade, twice as many as in the decade before. But for the up-and-comers in Mitchell and Kenyon country, Trains and trams were for a different form of escape, the excursion to the seashore. People actually had weekends, they had time available, and they were starting to get a little bit more money in their pockets that they could use to spend to go to places like Blackpool or Morecambe for holidays. As Mitchell and Kenyon's films show, the beach resort was where anyone could dream of moving up. The seaside holiday in Britain was aping their betters. And the dressing up is part of that. When the ordinary working people wanted to be smart, they could dress up and look just as smart as the bosses. You cannot tell who are the bosses socially and who are the working people socially because they're all dressed almost identically. Another sign of working class people with money to spend. Professional soccer, football they call it over there, which started in the filmmaker's backyard. It's no coincidence that the first industrial nation produces the first professional sport. David Russell teaches about football and other leisure time consumer products at the University of Central Lancashire. It's very clear that most of the crowds were working class. There are some wonderful moments of miners still in their pit dirt. I mean, they come straight from the shift at the pit, straight onto the terrace. It's quite a ways from the beginning of the 20th century to the beginning of the 21st. And one of the best places to measure the distance is here on the pitch of the Burnley Football Club. And look, I think I see them coming now. It's Burnley and Manchester United. The two teams would have been evenly matched back in 1901, with Burnley perhaps even the slight favorite. But that was then. Burnley typify what happened to the smaller town clubs and what slowly happened over the 1960s then accelerated dramatically in recent years was that the big city clubs got ever richer and the small town clubs who just could not attract the top players got ever poorer. And Manchester United? The standard jive about Manchester United fans is they all come from London or New Zealand or China which isn't entirely fair, but they are very much a global brand. They're now the only English football club that really makes a profit uh, and the, the richest football club in the world. And the connection between sports and marketing, the M&K cameras caught that too. So one of the things that most struck me about looking at the films was the density of the advertising. Products like Oxo and Bovril, these beef health drinks, they're being advertised at the games virtually from the word go. And Mitchell and Kenyon's final preview of the media age. Who do you think invented bringing athletes not to the field or to the fans and the grandstands, but directly to the camera? The entry onto the field, where you see the players come out in single file and being directed towards a specific point of the pitch. There's significant evidence that it's actually the film that's creating that form of entrance. <laughs> Sager, Mitchell, and James Kenyon showed in their sports films that they were true media pioneers. Their clumsy, slow equipment missed almost all of the goals and much of the action, but they hardly cared. The message of their media, it's all about the fans, the folks, the paying customers, especially those who might have a few pence left over after the game to pay to look at themselves on the big screen. 
the 20th century pretty much followed their lead. I'm Dave Marish for Nightline in London. I'll be back in a moment. Sunday, George Stephanopoulos' guests on This Week will be Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice on Iran and Iraq and Jose Canseco on baseball and steroids. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Chris Bury in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. <laughs>